little time warp here. It's August 1997. I'm on tour with a band called Swell, playing drums. I'm told that we're an indie rock, shoegazer, neo-psychedelic band. I'm not really sure what that means, but that's what I've been told. I'm having a good time, it's a blast. But you know what, I'm starting to feel a little bit a little bit restless. Some things were missing from my life. For one thing, I wanted to learn more about drums and rhythm and musics. Not music singular, but musics plural. as a worldwide phenomenon. For another, I wanted to do something with my life that more expressly served others and gave back in some meaningful way. Don't get me wrong, playing drums was really fun. I enjoyed it a lot. Our fans seemed to like it but I felt like I could do something more, something a little bit more meaningful to me anyway. And that's when I found something called ethnomusicology. Its seven syllables are really a mouthful, I know, but its central tenet is concise, to consider all musical traditions as worthy of understanding and honor. Now, it's not to say that ethnomusicologists don't consider Beethoven or Brahms to be badass. They do. It's just that ethnomusicologists also know that gamelan musicians from Indonesia are among the most amazing ensemble players anywhere. That the music of India is as complex as any, if that's what you're interested in. And that popular music from hip hop to punk rock and beyond has a profound power to spark real social change. And I just love that photo of the bad brains. Do we have any bad brain fans in here? I just always have to ask, sorry. So, um, so, you know, and on and on and on with ethnomusicology. And so what does one do when they want to become an ethnomusicologist? There's no big ethnomusicology corporation back east to, you know, go and intern at. That's what Smithsonian kind of. So you go to grad school. And in grad school, you attend seminars, right? You study music. You read about music. You talk about music. You write about music. You write more about music. And sometimes you even get to play some music. But in my experience, nowhere was the diversity of the musical uh, diversity more um, apparent to me and more available to me than in the archives, actually, ethnomusicology archives. See, ethnomusicology archives are warehouses full of sounds and musics from all corners of the globe, musics you're not going to find on Spotify or Amazon. I like to think of ethnomusicology archives as outposts of sonic difference. And so it was about two decades ago after I was playing drums that I went to school and then I started working in one of these archives at UCLA where I was helping to preserve and promote recordings in that institution. And by doing that work, by preserving and promoting musics of people who were more often than not marginalized, colonized, silenced, and oppressed, I felt like I had found that other thing I had been missing when I was on tour, that sense of giving back in some small way and serving others. So ethnomusicology, studying musics, check. Giving back in some way, check again. I thought I'd really found my way. But there's still five minutes left to my talk, right? So I can't, I'm not done yet. So um, as I started working in these archives, I noticed they had kind of a problematic origin story, actually. See, Ethnomusicology archives, but the discipline itself, along with a lot of other social science disciplines, are byproducts of a Eurocentric colonial mindset, right? Ethnomusicologists extracted sounds, stories, images, ideas from afar, and then consolidated them, locked them up essentially, in Western, you know, US and European research institutions, where they're really only accessible to a privileged few. And on top of that, who do you think was given credit for the scholarship and the commercial products that flowed from these collections? Right? There we go. And so, and so there I was, and still am actually, drawn to but troubled by ethnomusicology archives. But two steps forward, right? Instead of giving up or ignoring these and other issues, 
many of my colleagues and I have decided to meet our concerns head on by way of a more inclusive and ethically grounded approach to the field. And I like to call it Ethnomusicology 2.0. And here are the, some of the core kind of values I associate with this approach to ethnomusicology. Collaborate, support, repatriate, and amplify. And I'll show you what I'm talking about. So collaborate, it's pretty obvious, right? Collaborate, sometimes the obvious needs to be stated, so that's what I'm gonna do. Collaborate, instead of, you know, going out and recording music based on my own personalized research agenda, why not work with others, see what they want recorded, and then share the credit for that work? Well, at UCLA, we had funding for two community partnership grants. One was called Archiving Filipino American Music in Los Angeles, or thankfully, A Familia for short. And the other one was called Gospel Archiving in Los Angeles, or GALA. So over the course of two years, my teams and I, we went out and met with our community partners. We talked to them, we had conversations, we figured out what their needs were. We recorded what they wanted recorded. We archived what they wanted archived. And then when all was said and done, we gave them copies of the recordings we made and made sure that they retain rights to all the materials so that if they ever wanted to release them commercially, they could do that without having to mess with the bureaucracy of University of California. So right, collaborate, not colonize. The next idea is support. So this is another way to extract ethnomusicology from its colonial moorings. You know, instead of taking collections from countries and putting them in the US or Europe, why not support archives in those home countries so that they can better care for and preserve their own collections, right? Well, in 2002, archivists, this is an incredible story, archivists at Radio Afghanistan risked their lives to hide some 50,000 recordings from the Taliban. They built a false wall, lied about their existence. So yeah, literally risked their lives. They've also, of course, endured an ongoing war spearheaded by the US. A few years later, Lorraine Sicada, a colleague of mine, and some of my other colleagues, we helped her get some funding to support Radio Afghanistan so that those brave archivists could get the equipment and training they needed to digitize and preserve the recordings they risked their lives to save. Around the same time, I also went to Tajikistan with Lorraine Sakata to do some training with archivists there, showing them the ins and outs of audio digitization. So right, support, not extract. Here's another core value, at the Musicology 2.0, amplify. So, Archives, not just ethnomusicology archives, are notoriously difficult to access. That's why many of my colleagues and I feel it's a post-colonial imperative to daylight or amplify our collections so they can be accessible by as many people as possible. So here at UW, I'm really excited right now, I'm working with a really talented group of students to develop a kind of interactive Seattle music map. And this actually relates to what James was just talking about. The idea with this app is that as you navigate and make your way through the city, your location will identify different historic musical locations and associated archives and collections, sounds, videos, photos, all those kinds of things. So let's say that you're on 12th and Jackson. You'd be like, oh wait, this is where the Black and Tan Club used to be. This is where Ray Charles used to play. Or you're on Capitol Hill. You'd be like, wow, just a few blocks away from here, that's where Jimi Hendrix had his first gig. He only made it halfway through before he was fired for being, you know, too rad. <laughs> and then here at UW, you go to the Hub Auditorium, you're like, Nirvana played here 30 years ago. That's crazy. And then this near riot ensued, and they were banned from the university after that. So that's the idea with that, kind of amplify our collections in that way, get them out there. And then this, um, we're also interested in working, of course, with record companies and promoting our collections online and putting them out in vinyl. And uh, another way to do it is to work with community members to ethically remix recordings, to make them kind of more appealing to a contemporary audience. And uh, so, you know, by doing that kind of work, by amplifying our collections, hopefully we can also, my wish is, raise revenue that we can then give back to the musicians who are on those field recordings or their heirs. So yeah, amplify, not silence. Repatriate is the last kind of value I wanna go over. Repatriate, one of the surest ways to reverse ethnomusicology's colonial mode is to give back or repatriate recordings from the archives to the communities of origin, right? 
So at UCLA, we had funding from the Grammy Foundation to digitize some 200 Native American field recordings. We made copies and gave them back to the Cherokee and the Zuni and other tribal nations. Here at UW, I've repatriated films, one of which documented the Hopi steak dance, but a film that probably shouldn't have been made in the first place and we shouldn't have had a copy of. And then following in the footsteps of my predecessor and mentor, Laurel Circum, here at UW, I continue to make copies of Native American field recording collections and give them back to contemporary Coast Salish peoples. So by doing this kind of work, by repatriating materials or giving copies at least of our materials, we try to reverse damage done, but we also try to hopefully revitalize nearly extinct musical traditions and languages, such as Lushitseed here in the Pacific Northwest. So let me end with what is, I think, the most important slide of all, an open invitation to all of you. Maybe you're a student who's interested in the Seattle music map. It's a pretty cool project. Maybe you're a community member who needs some help, you know, documenting your own musical heritage, or you're interested in helping with archives abroad, or you want to amplify our collections in other way. Whoever you are, whatever your interest and whatever your background, Ethnomusicology 2.0 has a place for you. So let's talk. Thank you. <laughs>